Welcome to Plant Diversity, everyone. Well, now that we've gotten ourselves out of bed, or in my case, at least, dragged from under the bed, I think we're beginning to be ready to talk about some cool things about plants and learn something about plant diversity. When we look out there into nature, we find that there's maybe about 10 million different kinds of organisms. We need some way to keep track of this number of organisms so that when we're talking about things, either scientifically or colloquially, we can refer to something that someone else actually knows what we're talking about. I mean, there's a lot of things out there. Well, there's a science of doing that, of naming organisms, and that science is called taxonomy. And one of the things we're going to do in this class is we're going to look at words like taxonomy, and we're going to break them into parts, and we're going to learn some of the Greek or Latin word, roots that make up these words. So the word taxonomy is a word in Greek, and right now it probably seems like it's Greek to you. It doesn't really have any clear meaning. So let's look at how the word's constructed and look at what the roots of the word mean. And suddenly the word taxonomy, which we know just because I've told you has something to do with naming organisms, sometimes it'll, somehow it'll start to make a lot of sense. So the three parts of this word are a prefix, a suffix, and right in the middle we have a vowel. So all Greek and Latin scientific words are constructed this way. Sometimes there's three parts, but in general there's just going to be two parts like this. So if we learn some of these word roots, we'll be a long way to understanding what these words mean. So let's look at that prefix, T-A-X, tax. What does that mean? Well, that is an arrangement. The suffix nomi means named. And the vowel links the two together. So taxonomy is the science of creating named arrangements. When we look at a taxonomy, we notice some unusual things about it. And perhaps the most unusual thing about it is that it is hierarchically arranged. That is, the names are in a hierarchy. So we find that there are different levels in this hierarchy. There's a top level, which is the most inclusive. And then underneath that, there's a number of other levels. I'm going to draw three, but there might be many more. There might be less. There could be as few as one. But we'll look at three levels underneath that. And then underneath that level, there are other levels. I'm going to draw two at each of these other levels. So there are two other levels under these, let, let's just say. Could be more, could be less. And that could go on quite a while. We'll see how long it goes on in just a minute on another slide. But someplace at the bottom of that hierarchy then, at this level, we're just going to call that the bottom, we have the least inclusive level. So part of being an arrangement, then, is that we have this hierarchy in our taxonomy. And the reason we have a hierarchy in our taxonomy of organisms, of names of organisms, is because how these organisms came to be. So here we have a slide from Darwin's Origin of Species. And if we look at this slide, 
these actually two trees here, we can notice that time, at least implied time, is on this dimension. And the other dimension isn't really named either anyway, and but we can think of it kind of as taxonomic relatedness, how related the organisms are they are to each other. And we can find our most inclusive and least inclusive levels on this on these trees. So if we looked at the top, including everything, and I'm just going to draw it here for simplicity, we would say that's our most inclusive level. So what I'm saying by drawing a circle like that is that everything on that tree is included. All of the organisms on that tree are included in that most inclusive level. If we looked for another level, a least inclusive level, we would find that at the top. So someplace up here. Drawn in purple now, we find the least. And ultimately that just includes one type of organism. So one species, we would say. The least inclusive level, at least for this course, is going to be the species level. Now, some of you might know there are things that are available below the species level, forms, varieties, etc. But at least for this course, we're going to consider the species level our least inclusive or most basic level. And the most inclusive, well, we'll talk about what we're going to call that in just a minute. So because organisms have evolved in this way over time, starting out with few organisms on the Earth and evolving the great variety of organisms that we see now with some major hiccups for a major, um, for major loss of organisms in there, we see that we get this hierarchy of organisms. Well, here's our taxonomic levels of classification. In the, so this is what we see in that kind of tree, these kinds of levels. So we have here, down this list, the names of the taxonomic levels. domain, kingdom, division. Now we call it divisions in plants, but it's the same thing as a phylum in zoology. But we're not going to call it phyla here. We're going to call them divisions. Subdivisions, classes, orders, families, genera, and species. And of course there are subgroups under all of these. But these are the major ones we're going to talk about right now. So if we looked at this hierarchy then we would see the division is up there at the most inclusive category. And that breaks into other kinds of categories. Now there's actually five kingdoms. Perhaps I can draw five little circles here. And those are the kingdoms. And that continues on down to the other groups, divisions, etc. There's not always two divisions in a kingdom. Sometimes there's many. Often there's many. Continues, etc. So it's like those little Russian dolls you saw. Perhaps you played with these when you were a kid, one doll inside the other. But in this case, we don't have just one doll inside the other. We have multiple dolls inside the other. So. Here we have Stalin, and he is like the big, most inclusive unit here, what we're calling the division. And then inside there we would find two other dolls, etc., all the way down the levels. So that's the hierarchy, the taxonomic hierarchy. Well, we've talked about this taxonomic hierarchy now. What about the organisms that are in that ta taxonomic hierarchy? So we have to distinguish now between taxonomic levels, is what we've been talking about,
and taxa. So taxonomic levels are just those levels in the taxonomic hierarchy. And perhaps we could even say more correctly levels of classification within the taxonomic hierarchy. Whereas taxa are really are is a a taxon is a real group of organisms. And perhaps we should do plurals and singulars here. So the distinction is taxa and taxon. Taxa is plural, taxon is singular. So more than one taxa and a single taxon. So if we were to let, let our pictures here at the bottom, we have a picture on the left of an oak, and we'll let that stand for the genus Quercus. And on the other side, we've got an alga. And this is a genus of alga. We're going to let this picture stand for that genus of alga. And this is the genus Acetabularia. Now, we normally underline generic and specific names. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. OK, so what are our taxa and our taxonomic levels here. So the genus, in each of these cases, that's a taxonomic level. It's a level in that hierarchy, and we saw it in the diagram a minute ago. Quercus, the genus Quercus, and the genus Acetabularia, These are taxa. So we can go out into nature and we can find a member of the genus Quercus. We can find a member of the genus Acetabularia. We can't find genus as a thing in nature. It's a level in classification. There are members of that at that level, like Quercus and Acetabularia, but that's what we've got. We don't have genus as a thing. Well, there are standardized endings for the levels of classification. at least for many of them. Now there's some with no endings. There's no standardized ending for the names of the domains or the names of the kingdoms. We'll learn those names in a minute. But when we get to the division, there are standardized endings. So in the kingdom Planty, we see that we use the ending Phyta to distinguish that level in the hierarchy. In other words, if we were to see the term Chlorophyta, we would know that this is a taxon at the division level. And we know that because of this ending phyta in there. So on down, if we looked at the class level, if we saw this ending opsida, for instance, in the word liliopsida, we would know that that's a taxon 
at the class level. And we would both know in both of those cases that it belongs to the kingdom plenty. So we'll learn some of these levels of the taxonomic hierarchy and the meanings of these levels as we go on in the class. This class is going to cover everything from the class level up to up through the division level. We're going to say a little bit about the kingdoms and a little bit about the domains, but that'll be on the next slide and we're not going to mention them very much again. Put dotted lines around them for now. So in the red box, this is what we're doing in plant diversity. We're not going to be concerned with the orders or the families. I teach another class, plant systematics, and in that class we are mainly concerned with the family and the generic levels. Okay, let's go on and look at binomial nomenclature. I hope you all are familiar with binomial nomenclature created by Linnaeus, who lived from 1707 to 1778. And he wrote the work that started this whole idea of binomial nomenclature. He wrote that in 1758, and that was called Species Plantarum. And so he established in that this idea that we should have two names. So let's look at our word binomial. And look at that, we already know nomial, we already know that name, or nomen, name. And by, in this case, the I serves as our connecting word there. By means two. So binomial use two names. So as is the case with almost all of our scientific words, the word itself is telling us what it means. Binomial means we're going to use a nomenclature, a way of naming things that has two names. So let's look at two examples of that. Let's say we're looking at acetabulary again. But now we want to look at a specific species of acetabularia. And the second part of these names, which are called the specific epithet, are often descriptive in some way of the plant. Not always, but it's nice when they are. So this acetabularia that I have put a picture of here is Acetabularia crenulata. I'll talk about what crenulate means in just a second. Let's look at the two parts of that name. There's the generic name. And there is the specific epithet. An epithet is a noun or an adjective that gives the characteristics of something you're referring to, of some, in this case, the characteristic of the organism. So if we wanted to know which acetabularia this is, well, it's the one that is crenulate. And what does crenulate mean? It refers to these little scallops here along the side of this cap. This is a cap. This is a really cool organism, by the way. It's called mermaid's wine cup. And I'm not going to give it all away by telling you what you're going to learn about this, but you're just going to be blown away by this organism. I guarantee that. So there's acetabularia crenulata with the crenulate, that scallop shape outside of the cap of this thing. And that's what it's named for. How about our oak? This is Quercus alba. Alba means white. 
and we can fortunately see that on the slide. So again, Quercus is the generic name. And Alba is the specific epithet. Alba means white, and if you look over here, if you look at the back of the leaf, the back of the leaf is white. It's got hairs on it, and so it is white. So Quercus alba. Which Quercus? The white one, the one with the white leaves, at least on the back. Well, as nice as this all is, and as well as this, these kinds of things work in some cases, naming of organisms based on their characteristics, there are cases where it doesn't work at all. It doesn't work well at all. And one of those is euglena. Euglena is a very unusual organism. We'll study it later on in the class. I'm just going to mention it very briefly here. For, because one thing you can see about euglena, it has chloroplasts. It's clearly green, so it is autotrophic. Auto means self. Trophic means feed or feeding. So euglena is self-feeding. It makes its own food through photosynthesis, autotrophic. So that would seem to put euglena really in the plant kingdom. It's got chloroplasts. On the other hand, euglena is mobile. And it's actually mobile in a couple different ways, but one of those ways is it's got a flagellum, which doesn't show up in this picture well, but there's the flagellum. You'll see it in the next little video. And it's unicellular. Now there can be algae, which are in the plants, planty, which are mobile and are unicellular. But there's not very many algae, like none, that do this. There's a euglena. This euglena doesn't have any chloroplasts. Some euglenas can lo use, lose their chloroplasts. And this guy is feeding on a unicellular alga. You can see the flagellum of the euglena there flipping around, and it's an engulfing in a food, going to be in a food vacuole, this unicellular alga. Well, plants just don't do that. So where do we put euglena? Is it, does it go with the plants, or does it belong in the protista with other things like amoeba and paramecium and things which do this kind of movement, which is called metaboly? Well, I'm not going to answer that question for you right now. We'll come back and look at it a little bit later, but I just wanted to say that nature isn't always quite as nice as we would like it to be from our classifications. There are things which aren't going to fit very well, and we're going to have to find some way of dealing with that. And sometimes we're just going to say, I don't know. Maybe we'll find out in the future through other studies that have, that have yet to be done, and maybe you'll actually do some of those studies. Well, let's look at our kingdoms and domains that we're going to be dealing with this semester. Now, the domain, you know, is the highest level in the hierarchy. And there's two of them. There's the eukaryotic domain, and there's the prokaryotic. And you should re-familiarize yourself with the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms. If you haven't done that already, I'm not going to cover it now as this is an advanced course, and you should know those things. But if you don't, your textbook, Raven et al., has good discussions of this, and you should take a look at it. So we have two domains. In those two domains, we have kingdoms. So there are two prokaryotic kingdoms, and those are the bacteria and the archaea. And in the eukaryotic domain, we have four. I think I said there was going to be five kingdoms before, but the newest classifications have got six with two prokaryotic domains. And these are the animalia, the 
protista. The plantae and the fungi. And I mention these things because in this class we are mainly, or really exclusively, with kind of an exception here or two, going to be dealing with the plantae and the fungi, these two kingdoms. But there's a problem. And that problem has to do with the protista and where your textbook places some organisms. So we're going to talk about that a little bit next and talk about these organisms that your textbook places in the protista, but we are going to stick back into the plantae. And once we've done that, we will move them to the plantae. I wish I could rewrite the textbook, but just by moving them for this course, we will then say we're just going to deal with the plantae and the fungi in this course. So we're going to redefine the protista from what your textbook does. So your textbook, an older edition of Raven et al., which we've adopted to save you a bunch of money so we don't buy the latest edition, talks about three groups of protista. So the plant-like protista, the fungus-like protista, and the animal-like protista. So they've got these three groups. Now the plant-like protista are really a lot like plants, and these have all been traditionally placed in plants. The green algae, the red algae, and the brown algae. So these are all algae, and they are all placed in the protista by Raven et al. And we are going to put all of these back in the plantae. Certainly the green algae belongs in the kingdom plantae, not in the kingdom protista. As you'll see, they are very closely related phylogenetically to everything else in the plantae, the green algae are. And the red and the brown algae have traditionally been put in the plantae, and I think we should just leave them there for this course. And so since I get to run the course, we are. We're going to leave them there. The fungus-like protista, there's two really weird groups here the cellular slime molds and the plasmodial slime molds, the weirdest organisms on Earth. In fact, I don't think they're from Earth. I think they came from outer space. They couldn't possibly have evolved here. They're just so crazily weird. Well, they don't really go in the protista. They definitely do into that. They don't really go in the fungi. They probably go in their own group, and we'll see that in the phylogeny in a minute. Or maybe they're should go in the animalia because they're pretty closely related to animals when you look at their DNA. But we're going to put them in the fungi. They've traditionally been put there and lack of a better idea, we might as well stick them there. And that leaves us with a very redefined protista. just the animal-like protista, things like amoeba and protozoa, paramecium, etc. So this is our protista, and we are not going to study them. So with that redefinition, we'll be able to say we are going to just study the plantae and the fungi in this course. Well, let's look at some, what some of these organisms look like. Here we have a green alga, a very strange organism. I don't really want to give it away here to, because we're going to come to these in a week or so, and they are just fantastically bizarre organisms. Change the whole way that you think about what an organism is when you start studying these green algae like this guy. But in any case, wherever they are, these don't look like what we traditionally think of as protista. They're not like the animal-like protista, and so we are going to put them in the plantae. They definitely have chloroplasts. Here's the red algae. My red pen is not going to work on this. And again, we're going to put these in back into the plantae. They are not very protista-like, at least in their gross morphology, and they have traditionally been put in the group plantae. 
Here's the brown algae. Now those are typical protista, aren't they? 50 meters long sometimes. Here we have some Japanese fishermen or algae fishermen harvesting them for commercial use. Huge plants, incredibly economically important, not just because they're used by humans, but because these great kelp forests are nurseries for fish. We'll get to see a little bit of that when we go and study them in a few weeks. And if we look at them underwater, there we have some of the plant-like protista. Well, they're not plant-like at all. I mean, they're not protista at all. They are plant-like, and we're going to put them in the planty, where we have traditionally had them. 50 meters long, some of those guys are huge plants. The brown algae, the kelps. And then we have the fungus-like protista. This is the, well, I'm going to let your imagination run wild on this for a minute. What would you call this thing? When we get to studying these plasmodial slime molds, we'll give this guy a name. But here you see it growing and producing a fruiting body, and it certainly isn't in the planty, and it really doesn't look like an animal, and it doesn't look like anything else in cot. In fact, maybe it should be in its own kingdom, but we are going to put these in the fungi. They've traditionally been put there, and I'll show you the phylogeny in a minute. It's not so far off to leave them in the fungi. So that leaves us with, then, a redefined protista for this class. and then putting the fungus-like protista into the fungi and the algal-like protista, all the algae, into the planty, and then we work on these two kingdoms, the protista and <clears throat> the planty and the fungi. And then that leaves us then with our protista, which we say sensu stricto, in the strict sense, consists of things like amoeba, and paramecium. So let's look at that word, those words, sensu stricto. Well, it kind of makes sense already. Strict, stricto, sense, sensu, makes complete sense in the strict sense. But we have to say, what do we contrast that with it, with sensu stricto? So Raven define the protista differently. They define the protista sensu in the sense of the wide sense, sensu latu. So in the wide sense. So we can look at these two different definitions. Now, sensu stricto and sensu latu just mean that there are different taxonomists who consider the circumscription, how we draw circles around the organisms, what's included in the circle and what's ex excluded from the circle. They do it in different ways. There is no official, official sensu stricto definition of protista. There is no official sensu latu definition of protista. That's why I say Raven et al. definition of protista is in the wide sense. Our definition in this class in plant diversity is in the strict sense. We're reducing it just to the animal-like protista. Well, we're going to end here a little bit with Looking at the phylogeny, just a tiny bit. So this is from the older uh, version of Biology of Plants, of Raven et al., but it's the one we're using, so we'll take a look at what the phylogeny shows here. And let's start by looking at this question about the slime molds. Those are the two guys we have put in to the fungi. And here's our fungi, and this is our fungi those two united. Now in general, taxonomists and scientists more broadly don't like to define groups like this. 
when they look at a phylogenetic tree, we would like to define groups always based on monophyletic groups. Mono means one, phylo means tribe. So the idea is one tribe or one group. Now you find a monophyletic group on a tree like this by imagine your have in your hand a um, scissors, or I like to draw these kind of like tin snips. Here's a big scissors. And you take that scissors and you cut a branch of the phylogenetic tree. If you can lift off a group based on one cut, so this would be a group, this cut would define the group animals, fungi, and slime molds, that is a monophyletic group. We could give a formal definition of monophyletic groups, but it's much easier to think about them as having the scissors in your hand and cutting the tree, and everything you lift off with that wolf cut forms a monophyletic group. And you can see that our group of fungi in red there cannot be monophyletic. We would have to make two cuts on the tree in order to get that monophyletic group we would have to make a cut here and we would have to make a cut here. We would have to make two cuts on the phylogenetic tree to get a group that contained fungi and the slime molds together. So this is a bad thing that I am doing and you may feel free to slap my hands next time we meet. But we're going to do it anyway. We're going to put the fungi and the slime molds together in Kingdom Fungi and let other people complain about it if they want to. Let's look at other parts of the tree. Here's our green plants over here that we've talked about. This is the group. It's a monophyletic group, and it contains the green algae and the land plants. So they clearly go all together. They don't go with other kinds of things that are in the... Um, that might be in the protista, which are way down on the, on the tree. Actually, they're not shown very well here on this tree because they don't deal with the protista that much except for these groups that are here. So putting the green algae in the land plants into the planty works fine. We're going to put the red algae in there too, and we're going to grab this guy, the euglenoids, and we're going to stick them all over here in the planty. Now that doesn't look that great. Actually, we're going to put the brown algae there too. That doesn't look that great. We're kind of grabbing things from all over the tree. I have two things to say about that. One, maybe three things. If we put these things in the protista, it wouldn't be any better. We'd still be grabbing things from all over the tree and stuffing them into a group. So we don't gain anything in getting monophyletic groups by putting all the stuff in that Raven and Curtis have, that Raven and all have into, uh, into the protista. We don't gain anything by putting them there. Two, traditionally, the brown algae, the euglenas, the red algae, the green algae, and the land plants have all been put into the planty. So we have history on our side. Three, this little thing down here, this little group down here means we don't know where these go. The evidence so far is not conclusive. Now we know something about where they go. We know that Euglena could go over here, it could go over here, it could go over here, we know that it definitely doesn't break it, branch off down over here next to the bacteria. We know it doesn't go over there. We know it doesn't go down over here. We know it doesn't come up here over to the out to the um, off this group that we're putting in the fungi or the animals. So we know that it comes off someplace around here on the tree, but we don't know exactly where. 
the molecular evidence and the morphological evidence is not conclusive. Same for the brown algae. So there's uncertainty. So when there's uncertainty, not why not just stay with the traditional way of doing it, put them in the planty, and that's what we're going to do for this class. So that concludes this lecture. We'll learn more cool things about plants as we go on.